Well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and thank you all so much for being here today to start this community conversation uh, together, to continue, I should say, this community conversation for all of us together. Um, I was getting a typical whiny note from somebody uh, on my way here saying, if they wanted people from the business community here, why would they make them travel 10 blocks? Shouldn't we have had it right downtown? And of course, one of the reasons we're here is because this venue is an example of a marvelous social enterprise. It's an example of precisely the kind of thing we're talking about in supporting a great organization like Servants Anonymous. So I'm glad some of you came 10 blocks or further uh, to be out here with us today because we got a journey that is a lot more than 10 blocks that we have a lot of work to do with together. Now, let me say, first of all, there's a lot of people in the room who do a lot of great work every single day, and our gratitude as a community is with all of you, but I have two special thanks. Uh, my special thanks are to Kathy Williams and to Steve Allen. Uh, Kathy and Steve agreed when they got those strange emails from me to take on the co-chair a ship of the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative, brought together a remarkable group of people, and continue to do great work. I'm thrilled that Steve attempted to retire and is now the chair of Calgary Economic Development, <laughs> and that Kathy is taking on a role continuing to steward the Calgary Poverty Reduction Strategy Enough for All uh, with Vibrant Communities Calgary. So thank you to you and to all the community volunteers that have gotten us here to this point. Let's hear it for them. <laughs> Folks, we have an enormous amount of work to do. There's no easy way of saying this. I know many people in the room, there are some folks that I don't know in the room, and I know that for those of you who work with people in poverty every day, that every single one of you can tell me amazing, amazing stories of folks that you've helped, of folks who you've taken out of poverty, who you helped build their families and put them in a place of dignity and real life. But we're not doing a good enough job. When we look systemically, when we look across our society, we can see that we have not moved the dial on poverty in our community, that the rates of poverty in our community haven't changed in more than a generation, that child poverty remains stubbornly high. Whatever we're doing, as much as it makes a difference for individuals and families, it ain't working for the system. And so all of us together today have to come in stripped of ego, stripped of background and say, all right, Where's the evidence? Where's the data? Where's the science? Where's the knowledge? Where's the wisdom? How do we move forward together to make a real difference for people living in poverty in Calgary? This keeps me up at night. It keeps you up at night. It keeps many of you up at night, and it should keep us up at night. But that means that we're in the right place to be able to move forward and make significant changes together. I was asked to share my thoughts on the definition of poverty. And I said, you know I'm a professor, right? I see my boss is in the room at Mount Royal University over there. Um, so I could probably do several weeks of lectures on technical definitions of poverty and the challenges with the low income cut off uh, and so on. And I'm not going to. Oh, maybe a little. But someone very smart to me the other day said, poverty is about context. It's about the place you're in. And it's about your ability to do the things you want to do or need to do for your family. And where your context and the reality in which you live can prevent you from doing that. And that's really what we're talking about. I mean, we know some stats. We know that people who are living below the low income cutoff line tend to be young. Interestingly, because many folks would say they tend to be seniors, but they tend to be younger. They tend to be families with children. Particularly, particularly but not exclusively single parent families. They tend to be recent immigrants. Note, I'm underlining the word recent. They could have a disability. They tend to be working. They tend to have jobs. They tend to live in the suburbs. Now that should challenge a lot of different stereotypes that we have. Because the poor, people living in poverty, are fully amongst us. And we can share lots of stories, like the shocking story that Steve shared about the family that has had every possible thing go wrong. And that's certainly 
part of the face of poverty in our community. But poverty in our community takes many different forms and sometimes many simpler forms. Poverty is the mom and dad struggling multiple jobs to make ends meet to try and give their kids opportunity in their community. Poverty is the 11 year old who doesn't have time to really just be a kid because he's gotta be home looking after his younger brothers and sisters because mom and dad don't get home from their shift work until eight or nine at night. Poverty is the retail worker trying to get extra hours and extra shifts and taking time away from her family in order to just get those few extra dollars. I'm hesitating telling you the next part because it's so personal to, and not about me, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. And many of you will know the person I'm referring to because this story has been going around the last couple of days. But I got a Facebook message from a good friend, someone many of us in the room know, who was in a terrible car accident yesterday. And she put out a Facebook message saying, I was in a car accident, don't worry, I'm okay, and all of those who made fun of my ugly big car, it helped me. And she said, and my insurance will cover it, and I've got health care, and I can get sickness and accident at work, or even long-term disability if I need it, but the guy who hit me in his big-ass truck, as she put it, didn't have insurance. Yeah, she went in a way that I wasn't expecting her to go. She said he didn't have insurance because he couldn't afford it, because he's a day jobber. And now he's missed a day of work because he's been in this accident. Yeah, he was stupid and he shouldn't have rear-ended me. But now he's missed a day of work. His truck needs to get fixed. He doesn't have any insurance. And we have just put him in a terrible poverty trap. And how's he going to get out of it? And you think that someone who's just been injured in a car accident can think about that says a lot about who we are in a community. But it makes us think in a different way about what is poverty and who is experiencing poverty in our community and how they're experiencing it. And that cliff that Steve was talking about, just how close we are to that cliff. When I think about macroeconomic indicators and some of the problems that we have in our community, I actually sometimes spend time thinking about the price of oil, <laughs> but actually spend a lot of time thinking about other numbers that make a big difference. And one number that I think about a lot of time is the amount of personal debt that we are holding in our community and how close so many of us are to that cliff. One bad accident, one unexpected illness, even in a place with universal health care, if you're a contractor and you find that you need back surgery, as I got a letter about yesterday, and you're going to be off work for a year and you don't have long-term disability insurance, never mind that you don't have to pay for your back surgery. How do we manage that with your family and your community? And of course, a potential layoff. I don't talk a lot about my personal background, but uh, I just, uh, I, someone posted a video out yesterday of me talking and I didn't remember recording the video. I must have done it, it really was me. Um, or there's some other really handsome guy out there uh, who is pretending, but, I was talking about my own family history. And you know, these days, I'm feeling pretty rich. Financially, not those headlines that you saw about my salary, but <laughs> in terms of community support, in terms of where I am. I worked in the private sector. I've been pretty well off. I've also been very, very middle class. I've also been poor. I've also been very poor. I was chatting with my mom recently, and my mom is getting morbid in her state of mind these days. And so every now and then, don't, don't worry, it's not that she's really sick, she's been doing it since she was 40. She wants, to talk, <laughs> she wants to talk about what happens after she's gone and some special bequests she'd like to make and so on. And she mentioned something in passing about some friends of hers who are actually very well off, and she says, you know, there's a, there's a word we use in our language, barakat. That, it means that they did something good in the past and they're being rewarded for their good. And I said, tell me a little bit about what they did in the past. And she said, well, you know, there was that time they gave me money for groceries. I didn't know that. And so I started to talk to her some more. And certainly when my parents' business failed in the early 1980s, that's not an uncommon story uh, in this community, 
we were in really bad shape. And sure enough, it was the support of family and friends, people loaning her money for groceries, that kept the community, that kept our family going within this community. You know, my parents always had small businesses and they were really bad at it because none of them seemed to succeed very well. <laughs> um, not like the pizza shop, Karen. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I think about when I was in elementary school and the beginning of junior high school, and I used to want to give my dad a night off every now and then, so I would do my homework between customers at the laundromat uh, on the counter. I wasn't very good at that either, but I did learn to make change like nobody's business. Um, I can still do it really well. And I made it through university. I went to high school and I made it through university. I never had fewer than five part-time jobs at any given time while I was in university. Most of them were on campus, which was a good thing. Um, and I had a lot of scholarship money, thankfully, that got me through that uh, and got me through grad school. My first job out, out of university, I got a raise after 12 months. And I remember standing on a street corner eating a slice of pizza with my roommate the day that we were, she also worked at the same place, the day that our raises were announced. And uh, we were on our way to something, and we were eating a slice of pizza on the street. And I said to her, you know something? With the raise that I got today, I now make more money than my dad ever made in his life. And she said, me too. And I said, why are we eating a slice of pizza on the street corner? <laughs> and she said, because we both grew up poor. <laughs> and we understand this. When I really wanted to launch the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative, one of the things I said at the beginning is, I don't want a report that is going to sit on a shelf. That, you know, we've written a beautiful report with great graphics and we can say we have a strategy now. I want a big idea. And I was thinking of the work that we did in the recently updated 10-year plan to end homelessness. And I said, I want a big idea like Housing First a big idea that we can latch onto that can fundamentally change the way we think about poverty in our community. And everybody told me there is no big idea. It's not like homelessness. It's much more complex. It's much more deeply intertwined with so many other issues. There's no way you're going to get just one big idea. People said poverty is bigger than money and income. It's bigger than homelessness. It's a social problem. It's an economic problem. It's a problem of access. It's a problem of belonging. It's a problem of joining into community. And I pushed back and said, I don't care. There still has to be a big idea. I'm not quite so sure um, on whether we got a big idea or not, or if the enough for all strategy is a series of big ideas. But I do know they're all, all those big ideas are based on a simple truth. Just before I came here today, I was on the Siksika Nation, uh, and we were talking about many of the same issues, poverty, community, but the conference I was at was about resiliency, and one of the elders gave me this. She slipped it off her own wrist and put it on my wrist, which was very sweet and very touching. I just don't know how I feel about the bracelet itself. <laughs> it's a bit random. Um, but it was sweet, and it made me think of community and of resiliency, and of what we're trying to build together. And I said on the nation that I felt funny coming to the nation to share with them the one simple truth that you may have heard me speak about before, the one simple truth that makes our community work. Because I said that truth is a truth. Oh, that's even nicer. <laughs> um, because I said that that truth is a truth that the Siksika Nation didn't need me coming to tell them because it was the fundamental truth on which the nation is based and has, re has survived for thousands and thousands of years. But I often say that the success of our community is based upon a truth that evades too many in this broken world. And that truth is just this. We're all in it together. That our neighbor's strength is our strength, that our neighbor's pain is our pain, that every single one of us has a stake in every other one of us. So when my family was going through those tough, tough, tough times in the early 1980s, certainly government had to be there. Certainly nonprofit agencies had to be there. But my mom had to be able to go to her friend for the grocery money. 
because every single one of us had to look after every other one of us. And to me, that really is the big idea in the enough for all strategy. There's a pun in the title, right? There's a double meaning. It doesn't just mean there should be enough for all. It says in this community, there is enough for all. And we have to make sure that that enough is getting into the right hands. And we have to figure out how to do that together. So if you haven't read Enough for All, you should read the Enough for All report on the Vibrant Community Calgary website. And let me just say, as a quick aside, Franco and the team and the board at VCC are doing great jobs, and I know they're going to make this thing a reality. But as I see it, I see the whole strategy as addressing three things. And those three things are putting people in community first, doing business differently, and collaborating with the end goal of reducing poverty always in mind. So let's go through those. When we put people in community first, we build personal networks of support. We create opportunities for people to work together to find local solutions. It's about community hubs. It's about peer support programs. It's about financial empowerment of individuals. But it's also recognizing that every single one of us plays a role. As a mentor, as a volunteer, as an advocate, but most importantly, as a friend. As someone who can look after others and turn to others. I'm hesitating saying what I'm about to say. I'm going to say it anyway. When I was a professor, and I see some of my former students in the room, I used to always have people read a beautiful piece that had been written as part of the Calgary Herald's Christmas Fund. You know, the Calgary Hill Christmas Fund is a wonderful program every year. And one of the things I really like about the Christmas Fund is every single day in the paper over the holiday season, there's a story about the agencies they're helping. I think Servants Anonymous has been on that list before. And they just go and talk to people. And there was this wonderful piece where two really, really good reporters for whom I have a lot of respect followed a homeless mom and her child around for 24 hours. You know, what did they do with their whole day? And no one could read that story without being deeply touched by the plight of this person and what had happened to her. But I'd give that to my students at the beginning of the semester. And I would say, turn your heart off for a minute. I want you to read this story and tell me what's really going on here. And the students would come back and say, this story doesn't make any sense. Because over the course of this person's day, she works with at least five different nonprofit agencies. She's sleeping it in from the cold. She's spending her day at Cups. She's spending time at the Calgary Public Library with her daughter. Um, when her daughter needed to run around, she took her to the Devonian Gardens, run by my colleagues at City of Calgary Parks. And there was some others in there as well. And they said, and not one of those agencies is helping her get out of the situation. Every one of them is making her day on a cold winter's day with her kid who's not in school bearable. Giving her lunch, giving the kid something to do, assisting her with childcare, no one is helping her. During her whole day, no one has helped her find an apartment. No one has helped her find a job. Someone else stuck up their hand in one of my classes and she said, the thing I didn't understand about this story is that this woman has two kids, and she's got one of them with her, and the other one is staying with her sister. And this person said, in my church community, if we knew that that sister had someone who was homeless and she took in one of the kids, and not her sister and the other kid, that person would be shunned. So why isn't her sister taking all of them in? I don't care if she's got a small house. Her sister's living on the street. And as we break down these stories, we realize that when the system as a whole isn't working, when we don't have that big picture of how the system as a whole can work, all the individual pieces can do their jobs incredibly well. But we don't attack the problem, and we don't help the person. And we have to be able to think about this in a way that makes a huge difference in what each of our own roles as individuals, as family members, as friends, as mentors, as volunteers, as advocates matter and how they matter. 
Second business. During the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative process, we pulled together a few business roundtables, the business leaders, and we talked to them about poverty in the community. And unanimously, unanimously, those top business people in the city talked about their community investment programs and the great work they're doing, donating money and volunteers and resources in the community. And don't get me wrong, it's great work. They talked about their philanthropy. They talked about encouraging their uh, employees to volunteer in the community. These things really matter. Not one of them talked about how they're using their own business tools and their own business processes in order to make a difference in the community. And so if you've ever heard me speak in the last year or so to any group that's largely about business, I really, really challenge them to think about their business properties and I give them two examples of things that they can do. Number one, go to their HR departments and I love, because I get emails every time I say this and give people homework, I did that. Go to their HR departments and call them and say, have you removed those two dirty words, Canadian experience, from our hiring criteria? Are you systematically making sure that we are hiring people from disadvantaged groups and people who we are bringing out of poverty? Number two, have you gone to your supply chain department, your procurement department, your purchasing department, and said, what processes do we have in place to make sure that the money we're spending in our community is being spent to support wealth-creating entrepreneurs in our community who are themselves hiring people who need jobs in our community? Because business has enormous power without taking your eye off the bottom line, but being very, very thoughtful in how you buy goods and services and how you hire people, you can make enormous differences. How do we make sure that we're hiring people with disabilities on an equal and thoughtful basis within our corporations? Understanding we may have to do things a little differently, but we have access to great, amazing brains when we do that and people who can do incredible work within our organizations. Have we thought about how we make that work? Have we thought about how we make our employees such schedules flexible so people aren't traveling at rush hour, something that I'm really important, um, is really important to me. But simple things like ensuring direct deposit for all our employees and thereby keeping hourly employees out of the clutches of predatory lenders so that they can actually have access to decent banking services. Simple things. The things that we can actually make a huge difference on. As a, as a municipal government, Actually, let me talk about financial institutions first. Financial institutions have a huge role to play on all of this. You don't work at one anymore, so I can't harass you about it anymore. <laughs> but a huge role. Increasing access to financial products and savings, helping people build assets and determine how they can build assets. And very, very importantly, oh, I'm going to be very political for a moment, providing safe alternatives to payday loan companies. It's a very, very big deal. And what about we, what we can do as municipal government? Well, you know what? We're also a very big employer. I have nearly 20,000 colleagues at the city of Calgary. And let me tell you, those questions that I am pushing everyone else to ask about their HR, about their purchasing, and so on, well, I'm doing the same thing. We can help to invest in important things like collaboration, community hubs like the source, and making sure that those things can happen. And the, <laughs> apparently, there's a new report out that's uh, from my own administration that it doesn't go as far as I would like, but I will tell you that I remain committed, as do many of my colleagues, to make sure we're stopping the proliferation of predatory lenders and payday loan businesses. It has to happen. So the third thing is all about building collaboration that is focused on our ultimate goal. When we collaborate, we succeed. When we work together, when we succeed. When we create partnerships, we succeed. It's about coordinated effort, and that is the foundation of the success of our work in fighting poverty. It's not just about government or nonprofit or business or individuals. It's about every single one of us. And it has to be community-based. So my colleagues at the City of Calgary do heroic work every single day, and I'm proud of them every single day. But sometimes I fight with them. And one of the things I've been fighting with my colleagues at the City of Calgary about has to do with 
what is taking so long for us to create a common intake process for low-income people to have access to city services? People shouldn't have to prove their income over and over again. We should be able to give people dignity, but we should also ensure that everyone has access to services that the city provides. That's pretty simple. But man, oh man, it took forever because there were silos even within the city of Calgary. Different departments doing things different ways. Lots of things we needed to overcome. There was a ton of work we needed to do within and outside the city of Calgary to listen to all of our partners to make sure it's worked. Good news is the common intake process is in place and it's working and it's helping people access the services they need for their own communities. My notes, I actually have notes today. You may have noticed I rarely have notes. And the notes said, stick to the notes in big letters right on top. <laughs> Reasonably, I've gotten some of them in there. <laughs> But the next, the reason I said that is because the next line says, why should we care? I think I probably made that point already. <laughs> poverty affects every single one of us in the community. Whether we're living in poverty or whether we're not, we are poor for living in a community where there is poverty. And so every single one of us needs to make sure that we're working on this and every single one of us, make no mistake, is vulnerable. Every single one of us is vulnerable. Every single one of our families is vulnerable, but that's not the reason we should care. The reason we should care is because others in the community are also vulnerable. We think we know what some of the solutions are. We don't have it all. As smart as Steve and Kathy and their team are, there may be better solutions out there and different solutions out there that we don't yet know. But we got a goal now. We got a target. We have to reduce poverty in Calgary by 50% by 2023. And we have to do it. The future success of our community depends on it. Remember, while our neighbor's success is our success, our neighbor's failure is our failure. So I have lots of homework for you. Once a professor, always a professor. Share, act. Share what you're learning today. Not from me, but from what you're going to hear. Share what you're learning today. Let all Calgarians know that this is something that matters to every single one of us. Then act. Figure out what you personally and your organization have to offer in your own community and just do it. Just do that. Mentor, volunteer, be a friend. Business, show leadership to ensure resiliency of your own workforce, of every single one of us, and partner with the nonprofit agencies in this room to help us create those networks. People always ask me, what makes Calgary so successful? And I always say, the mayor. <laughs> I never say the mayor. <laughs> but the other thing that I never say is I never say it's because we have natural resources nearby. And I think that the core success of our community is not just that there are carbon atoms in the ground somewhere nearby and that the success of our community rises and falls on the WTI numbers that we hear every day. The success of our community is that we are uniquely successful in a very special thing. Remember how I said we're all in it together. The next step of that, and if I'm being all academic about it, is I say that we are generous in sharing opportunity. That we are generous in sharing opportunity for everyone in the community. You probably heard me say it before. But somehow, by some providential note, by luck and by hard work, we managed to create a place where it doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter how you worship, it doesn't matter whom you love. Every single person in every single corner of this community, regardless of their circumstance, regardless of their background, must have the opportunity right here, right now, to live a great Canadian life. And we've done a wonderful job in ensuring that. 
for a long time, but you know what? It doesn't come without a fight. It doesn't come without a fight. It doesn't come without us fighting the forces of small-mindedness and intolerance everywhere we find them. It doesn't come without us saying that it is not acceptable that every kid in this community does not have access to an outstanding education. It doesn't come without every one of us saying that the person who serves us coffee at Tim Hortons in the morning needs to have the opportunity to have that great Canadian life and that life of dignity right here. Open brackets. With a pathway to Canadian citizenship. Close brackets. <laughs> That's my, my other speech on the temporary foreign workers program. But we are at great risk. We are at great risk. Because if we allow those opportunities to only accrue to certain people in our community, if we don't ensure that that sharing of opportunity happens with every single person in our community, every day we let poverty grow, every day we don't stop poverty and bring it down, we risk all the success we have ever won for this city and for the people in this city. We risk it all. For a long time, my family story was a typical one. Family comes to this country, the parents struggle, they sacrifice, they do it for their kids, their kids do well. My sister and I both went to university, we both have good careers, she's launched a family, I'm a bit useless that way, and her kids will also do extremely well but it's not happening for everyone. We're starting to see multi-generational poverty outside of the First Nations communities in this, in this city for the first time ever. We're starting to see people in that poverty trap. We're starting to see people who cannot get out. These are troubling signs. These are things that need to keep us awake. And by the way, we also need to say to the folks like my parents, you came here for your kids. You came here to sacrifice for them, but you know what? We as a community deserve the best of you. And we want you to have a life of dignity, not just your kids. It's something else that we need to continue to focus on every single day, and this is going to take work. It's not going to be easy. For a lot of the agencies in this room, it means we're going to stop doing stuff that's been successful to do stuff that could be even more successful. It means setting aside who we are and what we do and focusing entirely on the people first approach to making sure that we're eradicating poverty every day. Because we need to make sure that every kid in this community every morning wakes up and says, you know what, I can do anything. I can be anything, and I can do anything and be anything right here in this place. And that's when we know that we have succeeded in our goal, and we have succeeded in reducing poverty in our community. That's what makes it worth it. Thank you all.